Hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, welcome to Fashion Coffee Hour. I'm Stanley Smith, and I'm here as always with Marcy, Marcy Carmack. We're going over these uh, important financial numbers and, and statistics on the retail industry and where we are today. You know, Marcy and I, we have actually had my calculator out. Marcy and I like to keep up on the latest technology, and we're always in contact with experts, leading experts on all these, in, all these topics. And that's what we're going to be talking about today as we welcome Anne Clarr from Barney's. She previously worked at Barney's and she's going to share the uh, inside scoop of uh, kind of the, uh, the retail landscape, <laughs> retail landscape. In New York and, City. Uh, Marcy and I, we're looking at some of these numbers seriously today and it's kind of a challenge. Uh, Marcy and I have been, well, each been to a number of seminars during the pandemic, of course, about how the uh, existing trends before the pandemic and the retail and luxury trade uh, were kind of exacerbated by the uh, onset of the pandemic. And we're pretty well versed in a number of those themes and uh, challenges and opportunities. But in looking at some of the numbers, I think I was struck by the idea that the United States, our basic gross domestic product is $22 trillion compared, by, compared to the worldwide uh, gross domestic product of $95, billion, 95 trillion. And total US retail sales is listed at 5 trillion. So there seems to be a big gap between the <laughs> 22 trillion total US sales and the five trillion retail sales. Marcy and I gotten into a little one-on-one -on -one about uh, luxury versus retail. Uh, we did look at luxury in the United States and it was about 200, I don't know, it was actually 71 billion. And the US or the worldwide was 20, almost 300 billion. So the Now we're US, going to quiz you on that. <laughs> <laughs> the US market, again, you know, we hear the contrary. It is still the largest luxury market uh, and with, largest economy with China on our. But battalion. again, it's uh, fastest growing uh, is a different story, a different narrative than the actual numbers. So that's fine. They might be growing. Same, same. We hear the same narrative with online sales. Online sales are the fastest growing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're overtaking uh, overall retail sales at this point. Uh, overall, worldwide, about sixteen percent of luxury sales are indeed online. So Marcy and I were trying really hard to, to frame this and put this in context, the topic of where the retail industry is, where it's been, and where it's going. We're going to take a quick look at this, this video about Barney's. And I think that, you know, if you listen to it, they were doing a lot of the right things. But Marcy's going to fill us in afterwards about some of the uh, missteps they, they took. Barney's new flagship store in downtown New York. 58,000 square feet just opened. Marbled and modern for the moneyed of Manhattan, but a homecoming too. Barney's was founded on this block back in 1923. There's much made about the nostalgia, but ultimately for us, it's an opportunity to engage with a modern downtown Manhattan customer that we believe is underserved. But Barney's isn't the only luxury retailer eyeing opportunity in Manhattan. Saks will open its first downtown store this spring and a second for men next year. Neiman Marcus and Nordstrom will open their first stores in New York in the next few sure years is. too. All told, they the city will gain 650,000 totally. square feet of new space by 2018. Do you think that New York actually has the capacity to take in all of these stores? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't comment on, on that. I think the customers and the market will eventually decide that. But what I'm confident of is that with our forward plans, it's carved out a very unique lane of business and has substantially differentiated ourselves from all of those comp competitors. That includes partnership with The Blind Barber to pull in more male clients, a Fred's restaurant, and exclusive collections that make up nearly a third of the downtown flagship. We really tried to, again, make it so that it was a complement to Madison. It's both about its small exclusive brands and it's also about carving out exclusive product within the larger brands that we carry. Customers might also notice the absence of registers. Sales associates carry iPads and customers can check out with Apple Pay. Having uh, a more mobile um, checkout experience and not a traditional cash wrap that's behind that the scenes is strange today. part that's of that. Strange. Barney's that's new that's downtown strange. location is part of the retailer's $200 million investment to improve its digital and physical experiences. 
This is thanks to Perry Capital being our very supportive owner who was able to settle our debt. Richard Perry's $10 billion hedge fund saved Barney's from bankruptcy in 2012. Since then, the retailer has seen record revenue growth, doubled profit performance, and closed 23 stores. This downtown store is the only significant store that we've opened, and that's quite intentional because Barney's doesn't need to be everywhere. Barney's needs to be profitable. And for Barney's, they see profit here on 7th Avenue. Barney's is really a survivor. Again, we're 93 years young at this point. There's always going to be headwinds and there are going to be market conditions, but there's strength in what the brand stands for. Well, Marcy, see, to my eyes, it looks like Barney's was doing a lot of things. I personally was never a Barney shopper or a big fan, uh, but on paper, it seemed like they were doing a lot of the right things. What went wrong there? Well, historically, they were over leveraged. You know, as you know, they went bankrupt once before this most recent time, and they just couldn't keep their head above water. And as um, Ann will tell us tonight, they went bankrupt this last time because the rent like tripled. So it, mm. it put them out of business oh. immediately. Okay. Well, I mean, retailing is all about. I mean, brick and mortar is all about physical retail space, a presence. I mean, the word uh, store actually comes from from Greek architecture terms. So uh, hopefully Anne can clue us in on that. That's a good nuance. I was intrigued by the third of their product line was uh, exclusive brands. So that means house brands. I wasn't aware of that. Well, wait, <clears throat> no, they always had house brands, but exclusive sounds like something other than house. No, uh, I think what... exclusive, I think, means what... house, house brands. I think that's what they were calling Okay, it. yeah. No, they all, they, to them. they all, they might have even sort of were on the forefront of that because they always had that. So you could, you could always get something fashion forward from Barney's that was less than designer prices. Mm -hmm. And then also that map of Manhattan showing that, I mean, I think we could all take a look at that and think, well, that's, that's oversaturated. That's just way too much retail. Way too much retail. I don't know what these people were thinking. And they just, <laughs> they I don't all, know what they were thinking. They all jumped on the boat. So, well, I'm looking forward to talking to Anne. And we have another guest joining us, Christopher, is that correct? Yes. This evening. So we're going to get the inside scoop, but um, hopefully that frames the topic this evening. And we will welcome back the expert panel. If you'd like to join us, I'll include my email address in the description. And we would be, Marcy, wouldn't we be happy to send an invite to these people? I think we would. We would. See you this evening. Take care. Bye-bye.